markets today. One is overseas, one is here in the US. The story overseas is the um, uh, um, the emerging conflict that we see in the Middle East between, uh, well, in Israel, the emerging conflict there between the Palestinians and the Israelis that threatens to engulf at least uh, that region. And uh, while the Middle East has always been a hot spot and that region in particular uh, now seems particularly um, uh, incendiary um, with the possibility that it could break out into all out war, that of course is gonna do what to oil prices? Any type of disruption in the Middle East, which of course any type of you know, large scale conflict is gonna do what to oil prices? Increase. Um, there is no oil either in Israel. Or oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm talking. You don't hear. You haven't heard me. My my volume was off. I'm so sorry. Pardon me. Um, I didn't hear you. You did hear me. Okay, then you you, you did hear me. So uh, did someone have an answer to my question? Someone said increase oil prices, but that's exactly Israel, right. I didn't hear that. That's exactly right. It's yeah, but Israel oil. doesn't have any oil in either. The Gaza Strip or Palestine don't have any oil in them. It doesn't, but the fact is, is that just any, any type of conflict in the Middle East is going to have an effect on oil prices because it's a region where a lot of the world's oil is mined. Um, uh, in fact, when we started in uh, late January, early February, West Texas Intermediate was trading at $52 a barrel. It's now trading at $65 a barrel. Brent crude, which is the the global benchmark was trading at $55 a barrel, and now it's trading at 68, which is an increase of 24%. So obviously um, there's been an impact on oil prices. I don't think the impact on oil prices is related to the overall impact on oil prices related to the um, conflict that we're seeing in the Middle East. I think that it accounts for some of the upward movement today in oil prices. Um, the big uptick in oil prices is due to what? Um, the growth in demand that we're seeing is what happens. People emerge from their COVID shell and um, we begin to see um, uh, people uh, flying, people booking hotels, people going out to restaurants um, with all of the attendant price increases that we would expect after we saw an absolutely catastrophic collapse in demand in the first quarter of 2020, which only now is starting to emerge. So we would expect to see um, uh, as the Fed likes to say, transitory price increases. Um, so um, that brings us to the, the next uh, headline news story of the day, um, which Andrew alluded to yesterday when we talked about um, CPI numbers. What was the headline domestic uh, it news today um, in terms of the economy? Anybody? This meeting is being recorded. Can you repeat that? What was the big headline news today? The CPI increased. Right, the CPI number came out. So the CPI number, which had previously increased, was 0.6%, went to 0.8%. So the expectation was that it would have increased by 0.2%. So this is four times that. So of course, you would expect the headline to say, US inflation soars to 13 year high, revealing fresh stress on the economy. The next number that came out at 8.30 in the morning was core CPI, which is the consumer price index without the, um, uh, without, uh, uh, the more volatile uh, food, and, food and energy costs included. And so the headline here was inflation rate well above expectation with supply shortages, increasing the cost of goods, service and materials. So we're seeing an increase in prices, whether it's in lumber or agricultural products like corn or even soybeans. Um, and then, of course, commodity prices, which are really um, increasing significantly, whether it's, um, or, you, you know, 20 percent in iron ore prices or 20, 20 percent in um, copper prices that we've been now seeing um, over the course of the last um, number of weeks, um, uh, it, along with uh, the increase in shipping rates, um, all of which is attendant and natural to what? An economy that is emerging from um, one of the worst uh, uh, crises it's ever experienced. Um, so we would expect to see big changes or at least big short-term changes in prices. That being said, some days market participants are not upset or uh, are not uh, um, uh, uh, 
concerned about the risks of inflation and comfortable with the idea of the Federal Reserve discussing transitory um, price hikes um, and its um, uh, continued commitment to maintaining an accommodative, an accommodative stance that it expects is going to help the economy to a soft landing. Um, uh, and then on other days, um, market participants get very unrelaxed and upset about the potential for inflation. Even though we've been through this, every single time we have had a crisis and it's recovering and we're concerned about inflation. Um, and so yesterday and today were two of those days and we saw um, major concern in, in the capital markets um, with regard to um, the potential for rising inflation. So as you see here, we saw an impact on all the major indices here in the US and then of course the global Dow I didn't include the European indices, indices like the FTSE or the CAC 40 in France um, because I wanted to focus on the domestic side. But again, of course, those European indexes and Asia indexes all took a hit today because of what's going on in the U.S. market. Why would the Nasdaq be particularly? Why would the Nasdaq, which is heavy with technology stocks, be 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 impacted in particular because of the fear of inflation? Can anyone tell us? I love that. That's great. That's exactly right. In other words, you have the tech heavy NASDAQ with very capital intensive growth companies and any uptick in borrowing costs is going to weigh heavily on um, uh, uh, their performance um, uh, with companies that tend to burn through a lot of cash. That was an excellent answer, Andrew. Thank you. Everybody heads up on that answer. He's, he's exactly right. Um, but even though the, the, the rise in consumer prices was higher than expected, if we take a closer look at the numbers, what do we see? We see that the inflation that we the inflation here in these immediate numbers um, that we're looking at um, at the top of the top of the slide don't tell the whole story and may not be um, may not may not have lasting power may not have staying power. So we look at the inflation rate on Monday. We looked at the inflation. We looked at the path of inflation from the beginning of January 20, before the pandemic hit, through March, where it increased 2.6%. So clearly there's a big jump from 2.6 to 4.2%. Let's concede that point. But if you look here, over the course of the last decade, let's say between the end of the Great Recession 2009, beginning of 2010, through today, where's inflation been? Mostly under 2%, isn't that right? And between these two crises, between these two crises, these crises have been bookends for what? ongoing and continued support from whom? Also Who's continued to provide extraordinary support for the economy since the, the Federal yeah. Reserve. That's exactly right. The Federal Reserve. That's exactly right. So what's the comment that the stimulus checks plus rising commodity prices plus supply chain issues plus the reopening are all short-term inflation drivers, just like the Fed has been saying. There's an expression I learned in business school that was many years ago, um, don't fight the Fed. And that lesson all those years ago, um, uh, back in the early 1990s, mid 1990s, is just as true today, which is don't fight the Fed. And we should be listening to the Fed, but market participants, just like people that are looking to buy gas, and suddenly we see panic buying all over the Southeast with lines and fights over gas shortages or gas shortages that doesn't exist. And if you've been paying attention, you know that the um, Colonial Pipeline is back online already as of this evening, expects to be at full capacity in a couple of days. So if you look here, I focus on reopening. What do you see if you look more deeply into the numbers in the CPI report? What do you see? One month price changes in enormous one month price changes in activities that were dormant, were dead because of COVID. And suddenly you see a huge surge in sporting events, plane tickets, hotel rooms. There's a semiconductor shortage, there's a circuit shortage. So of course, 
computer prices are rising, and used cars as people are looking to travel over the summer and get back um, to a more normal way of life. And so you see these te Professor? temporary. Yeah. Go ahead. The point is, is we're seeing these these transitory one jump. Uh, these one-time jumps in prices that won't continue. So what did the Fed said? What has the Fed been saying? It's been saying they're going to tolerate inflation higher than 2% for making adjustments with its interest rate policy that preempted inflation in the past um, that might not have been as effective had, it, had, they had, wait, had they waited. And so what is the Fed betting? It's betting that this transitory inflation is going to fade next year back to its long-term 2% goal. And so over the next, last two days, we saw the Dow shed about 1,500 points, a little over 4%. And okay, so it had a panic attack with regard to inflation. I suspect we're going to see um, a, a, a recapture of um, some market performance, positive market performance over the next couple of days as market participants really begin to digest uh, the scope of the data, um, which is more than just um, the one-time increases that we see here at the top of the slide. Um, as um, indicated here with the um, one-time uh, price changes that are not going to be month after month. Um, and again, as one would expect after a, a shutdown of more than a year, not just regionally or nationally, but internationally. And so suddenly everybody's waking up, businesses are gonna start to open, people will start to travel, people will start to eat out and do all the things they stopped doing naturally you're going to see a surge in prices, um, all of which is um, complicated by the fact that there are supply chain issues that uh, frustrate um, uh, uh, the proper functioning of supply chains, um, along with all of the drivers you would expect to see in a recovering economy like, like rising commodity prices. When you throw into the mix the force multiplier of trillions of dollars of stimulus coming from the Federal Reserve and the, um, and, uh, um, the stimulus packages being offered by the Biden administration, all of that um, has an enormous uh, positive spending uh, impact on the um, economy. Um, and so that was what I wanted to discuss today. Yeah, go ahead. Professor, I just want to add that you also said you said that there was a, a saying not to fight the Fed. There's also saying not to let the genie, the inflation genie out of the bottle. And I don't I think what if what if it's there? It's not trans transitory, the inflation uh, pressures. Wouldn't that be problemsome? Because then they have to really hike up rates to catch up for all the space that they they gave inflation. That's agree. I agree with you. But again, this is the type of spinning that I I I, I, I try to avoid and advise others to avoid because I'm relying on what the Fed is seeing, the data that they're seeing. That as recently as last week, they were reassuring us about the inflation that they are seeing and that they're seeing in um, degrees of um, granular detail um, that I don't see. Um, and I'm going to defer to the people that um, uh, ran the rescue of the economy from the greatest crash since the Great Depression back in 2008 and the Great Recession. It's the same team in place. And oh. so everything that they've been saying has been right. And so I believe what they're telling me now, which is these are one-time price increases and the fear isn't there. And the market has a tendency to overreact. We talked just the other day about destabilizing speculation. We talk about um, a, a, a panic about gas prices, people on lines, people fighting, uh, people rushing to get gas, whether it's in North Carolina or down in Florida, where I have family, I heard about that uh, earlier today. Um, and it's, uh, um, it's not based on reality. It's based upon fear and panic, much like the oil prices in the Middle East, in the, in the middle, the, the oil prices, oil prices will rise, regardless of the fact that Israel and the area which surrounds it is not heavily invested with oil, but because it's in the same region where there is a ton of oil and any type of disruption there is going to bleed over into other parts of the region. So it's a concern, naturally, any type of unrest in the region. Um, so talking about unrest, we look at the colonial pipeline shutdown and what do we see? It's going from the, um, I, I mean, it's just enormous. It goes from the, um, uh, excuse me, pardon me? As you see here, it's running all the way from the Gulf Coast down here by Baton Rouge all the way up to New Jersey. So it's the nation's largest conduit for gas, supplies the country about 50%, supplies the East Coast about half its gas. What was the headline today? 
gas shortages in Southeast widened due to panic buying. Well, sure, people are panicked, so they're using up the supply that's there. Um, but again, it's panic buying and not based upon uh, reality. We as global managers are expected to remain calm and sift through the data and see what the real answer is. And again, getting back to your comment, Andrew, about not letting the genie out of the bottle, I think that's a, that, that's, you know, a reasonable statement. Um, I understand the concern, but again, I'm going to defer to what the Fed sees and what the Fed is telling us. Because oh, Also, um, Professor, I've also heard another critique from analysts about uh, the same team that was in charge now. Is there also the same team that uh, mentioned that they had subprime mortgages under control and that it wouldn't bleed into other uh, sectors of the economy? You're saying that during the crisis that yeah, in they, reassured, they reassured us in 07 and 08 that the subprime mortgage problem wouldn't bleed into other sectors of the economy. Is that and, right? And they had it under control, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I, I think now they're just, I, I think it's a mixture of politics and data. Because if they do, like, let's say they do tell us- What is the alternative? What yeah. is, here's a perfectly fine, fine question for you and the rest of the class. What is the alternative? They, they, the economy they, that has contracted enormously and has suffered enormously with millions of people still out of work and food insecure or housing insecure, what is the alternative that the government do that the Federal Reserve not um, pump money into the economy to try to stimulate demand and get people to borrow and spend money that the uh, White House, the Biden administration should not provide packages that alleviate the burden of childcare and that make uh, uh, education more accessible, make healthcare more accessible, that allow working men and women across the country to achieve the, the American dream. Um, what else should the government do during a time of enormous distress? Because what the Republicans are proposing is to cut the rescue packages that's being offered by the White House down to the bone, because they're not concerned about improving the lives of working men and women as much as they are improving the lives of wealthy men and women. And that's really the truth of it in wealthy corporations. Um, and so, you know, a reasonable person has to say, what is the alternative? So Andrew, what is the alternative that they should do nothing and avoid the possibility? We understand there's a possibility of runaway inflation, but the Fed is vigilant. What more can they do other than be vigilant and take the steps that are necessary to address the enormous crisis that we find ourselves faced with? Well, I, I don't know exactly what they can do, but I think that... Republicans are saying spend less money. They say spend less money. Don't offer a $2 trillion package. Offer a $500 billion package and do a fraction of what you said. But when Donald Trump took office, they didn't blink when the Republican-controlled Congress said, well, we're going to give a $2 trillion tax cut to the wealthiest corporations, the wealthiest people in the country. They didn't blink when that increased the debt by $2 trillion. They didn't blink, they didn't care about the deficit, but now they care about the deficit. Why? Because it's hurting, it's helping people that they don't wanna help. And I, I welcome anybody's uh, input or comments on that, but uh, uh, we have to call it for what it is. That's exactly what it is. Um, and so my question gets back to, I understand the concern about the inflation. I also understand that the market is driven by psychology and sentiment, whether it's the oil markets or particularly now the stock market indices at a time when we are at a particularly um, sensitive time as we transition from um, a crisis-driven economy to one that is going to be self-sustaining, um, uh, that there is an enormous amount of nervousness. But that being said, what else can we do? We can't um, uh, neutralize all the potential risk. All that we can do is prepare as best as possible. And that seems to me to be what the Federal Reserve is doing. I, um, I can't find another answer. I, I think that the can that has been being kicked down the road has uh, been kicked down far enough. And uh, if some like in the in the end something is going to happen, and I feel like the more you kick it down, the bigger the the crash is going to be. All right. Well, I believe in the strength of the U.S. economy, and I see that the 2008 the market went down to 6,500 the Dow. Now it's almost 35,000, which is an emblem of the economic power, economic primacy of the U.S. economy. And I continue to believe in its ability to succeed and excel. And therefore, as the economy grows, the burden of those payments will only diminish. Um, um, so I tend to believe that the class is half full um, uh, as opposed to being half empty. That said, I wanted to discuss 
um, the colonial pipeline um, only as, uh, as an illustration of the um, uh, new geopolitical threat that we face in the 21st century where warfare um, can be waged like this um, through the internet and cyber warfare. We understand that this uh, uh, attack uh, to disable this major pipeline was uh, approved by or orchestrated by Russia's uh, security arm. Um, and so I've heard people say, well, this is the beginning of the end. My comment to that is it's not the beginning of the end. It's just a matter of the US recognizing the challenges that it faces and will beef up its critical infrastructure and that we will be better prepared the next time. But this isn't going to go away. The fear of inflation isn't going to go away. It's happening. We have to trust in the people that we've appointed to the offices um, uh, that manage this type of thing, the Federal Reserve and the um, administration, that they know what they're doing, um, which is uh, uh, um, my argument here, um, much like uh, the response of the government to uh, what is um, a foreign invasion on our critical infrastructure. So I have nothing further for you on this. Um, so I'd like to just take a quick review. Um, we talked about the other day on non deliverable forwards, remembering, just quickly reviewing, it's a short term um, over the counter cash settled currency forward. It's always settled in dollars. What it allows companies to do, particularly companies that are working in emerging markets, whether they're emerging and developing or frontier markets, that they can, with, it, with their capital controls in place, um, companies can uh, enter into non liberal forward um, that will allow them to lock in the value of their receivables or lock in the cost of their payables. Okay? Um, it eliminates a company's. Um, uh, 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 reliance on local markets, it minimizes, of course, the conversion risk, the translation risk, and uh, um, uh, has emerged as a very important tool for global managers um, looking to hedge the risk um, uh, that comes with um, working in uh, emerging market countries. Um, oftentimes where we see, um, as we looked at the other day with the IMF list, um, capital controls in place that some way um, either limit or completely cut off uh, the forward market. So, we, point, we identified the, excuse me, the various elements of the non deliverable forward, including the currency, the settlement date, the notional principle. What's key is the value of the, the value of the contract at origination versus the value of the contract at the settlement or at maturity. So we're looking at the U.S. dollar value at origination versus the U.S. dollar value at um, maturity and coming up with the difference. If um, it's an account payable and the currency strengthens, well, then the bank is going to reimburse the firm. If it's an account receivable and the currency weakens, again, the bank is going to pay the firm. Um, in the other case, the firm is going to pay the bank. So let's take a look at an example. This was a US-based multinational called Zarina Motors that has six month account payable of real 5 million. In this case, there was no deliverable real market. So the company entered into a NDF with Citibank. The Taibot contract rate at origination was 26.54 for 26 cents and 54 basis points. The settlement rate was Brazil's central bank closing rate in six months or 180 days. Pardon me, folks. So the question I have for you is, if Brazil's central bank rate in six months is 0.3402, what are the cash flows? The first question is, is did the currency strengthen or weaken? Can someone tell me, did the Looks currency like strengthen strength. or weaken? Looks like strength is. Well, of course it strengthened because today it's buying me 26 cents in change and it's going to buy me 34 cents in change in six months. So of course it's strengthened. That means my accounts payable is higher. So it's a good thing we put together the NDF because the accounts payable is still due and the size of it has grown because the currency is strengthened. But because I have this basically the call option with the non liberal forward that's liberal in dollars, I'm protected. So or the company, excuse me, was protected, Serena Motors. So the contract, the dollar contract value at origination was the 5 million times the spot rate was 1,327. So we know that the company won't pay more or less than the NDF contract value, dollar contract value at T0. 
The contract value at maturity was the notional principal times the 34 cents and change gave us a million 701. So the currency strengthened. That payable is still due. So it has to be satisfied, but the bank is going to pay, reimburse the company, the difference, the amount above the, the US dollar amount above um, what the US dollar contract amount was at origination. So the difference between the million 701 and the million 327, very simple, is the 374 that the bank pays the firm. Are there any questions here? Okay, good. So another way to look at it is you can say, look at the difference between the spot rates multiplied by the real, the notional principle, that's going to give you the 374 as well. We moved on, we talked about interest rate caps, which is effectively a call option on interest rates, which limits your costs, it allows companies to establish a minimum cost, right? Excuse me, it allows companies to establish a maximum cost. It's called the knock-in option. Why? Because the option becomes effective once the strike price is hit. So for example, if you have a floating rate loan to finance um, uh, your trade activities, your international trade activities, and uh, interest rates are going to rise or interest rates do rise, of course, that's going to increase your costs, much like Andrew was saying with regard to tech companies that are borrowing lots of capital to grow um, that are very sensitive to changes in interest rate, which of course increases their costs. Well, so it's the same thing here. What interest rate cap here, what an interest rate cap does is allows us to cap um, the, the, um, uh, the interest rate. So we talk about the cap elements, which was the interest payment, the cap cash flow, and the premium payment. Then we talk about interest rate floors, which allows a company to establish a guaranteed minimum return. So a company has an asset sale, they have a cash inflow coming, they're coming in, they have a concern about being able to, they have a concern about being able to um, uh, um, get the return that they're required to meet their hurdle rate, where well, they can enter into a contract that sets a minimum return on investment. Um, we identified the four elements as the interest yield, which is the return, plus the floor cash flow, plus the premium payment. So let's take a look at an example here with a Queens-based exporter. I'm thinking, I think he's in Forest Hills. Borrows $25 million or borrowed $25 million for three years price at one year LIBOR to fund expansion CapEx. But of course, he's concerned that rates will soon rise. To hedge, the company bought a three-year interest rate cap. The reference rate was three month LIBOR. That means what? You have quarterly payments. The premium was 180 basis points on the 25 million and the strike price was 5%. In other words, the exporter is not gonna pay more than 5%. And if he has to pay more than 5%, he's gonna be reimbursed with the interest rate cap. So, one year rates rose to 645 in the first period. And the question is calculate the first period cash flows. So the interest payment is the 25 million times the 6.45%. But what do we have to do here? We have to take the fractional part of the year because it's only a quarterly part of an annualized interest rate, which gives us the interest payment due of 403.125. Next, we have the cap cash flow which is the difference between the spot price and the strike price multiplied by the notional principle, along with the fractional part of those annualized rates gave us cap cash flow of 90,625. So what's happening here? The company had to pay the 403,125 from the, to the lender, but then were reimbursed by the bank, the 90,625 because of the increase in rates. How much was the premium payment? What did it cost to put on the cap? Well, 180 basis points on the 25 million is $450,000. But what do we need to do here? We need to amortize that cost over the life of the loan in order to be able to calculate the actual um, uh, savings that will accrue to the company um, when we complete the exercise. So we have to divide by 12 periods. Why? Because it's three years, 
quarterly payments, four times three is 12 periods, means it's $37,500 per period, the implied payment for the premium. So what is the net cost to the company? It was the 403 that was paid, the 90,000 and change that was received, the 375, which is the amortized cost for the premium that was paid for a total of negative $350,000 that went out the door to satisfy this um, loan for the period. In order to calculate the annualized rate, what do we need to do here? We need to extrapolate the one period figure to an annualized figure. So because it's a quarter, we have to multiply it by four. If it was semi-annual, we would multiply it by two. Then we divide it by the notional principal amount, and that gives us 5.6%. That means our implied annualized rate using the cap was 5.6% versus the 645, which is the market price, the market price for the period. The savings then was 85 basis points. So 85 basis points. Yeah, this, the savings was over $200,000. So it's an enormous savings. And of course, um, uh, 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 further evidence as to why these tools, um, although reasonably simple and straightforward, um, are, are incredibly powerful and useful for global managers in all their, their, their financing activities. Are there any questions on this problem? Okay, let's go forward then and do a quick review of currency straddles. So we, we had some fun yesterday with the, the, on money with the currency straddles, which is another very handy tool um, that companies use to hedge the upside and the downside of a particular trade transaction. So in this case, the currency straddle, the company is buying call and put options that have exactly the same strike, but um, ha have exactly the same strike price and expiration date. Right. So we talked about a, a, a dealer uh, from Brooklyn in Park Slope, actually, a Park Slope based Brooklyn uh, uh, furniture manufacturer that imports wood from Morocco that had outstanding Moroccan Duram payables of two million, as well as a possible sale of Duram in three months of four million. That meant that in two months, that it meant, excuse me, in three months, they'd either have a two million Duram payable or two million Duram receivable. So they put on a straddle in order to hedge the risk that either the currency will strengthen or the currency will weaken, either increasing their cost or decreasing their value on their receivable, okay? So if the sale is successful, the put options will hedge them on their receivable of 2 million dirham. Otherwise the call options, if it's unsuccessful, will hedge them with the, um, uh, uh, um, the cost of the 2 million dirham. Excuse me. We pointed out that the DRAM contract, the option contract controls 500,000 DRAM. That means that if the company wants to control 2 million DRAM, it has to buy four calls and four puts, which is exactly what they did in order to control the 2 million DRAM. We then went through and we calculated all the various potential outcomes, the various potential outcomes at three different potential spot prices. At 9.8 cents, if the, if the um, spot rate was even, if the spot rate weakens, if the spot rate uh, strengthens. And what did we find? We found that when the sale was successful, the put option protected the company against a drop in the value of the dirham. And when the sale was unsuccessful and there was a 2 million dirham payable, that when the spot price strengthened, that the company uh, the company's call options protected it against a rise in the value of the DRAM and helped to minimize the cost. Are there any questions on this? Okay. So now let's talk about currency strangles, which are exactly like currency straddles, except for what? You have call and put options, but instead of the same strike price, you have different strike prices. So you're you're protected within a range of values with it rather than in one specific value. What do you think the big difference is in terms of cost between a strangle and a straddle, which is more expensive? Uh, 
actually a straddle is a straddle is more expensive. A straddle is more expensive. Okay, so here the company is hedged outside of a range of value rather than just one specific value. So again, we have our Moroccan, uh, or it's exactly the same problem. So instead of using a straddle, let's see what happens if they used a strangle. Okay, the conditions remain the same. So here we say, what happens? Excuse me. Excuse me. So we have here the call strike price was 10 and a half cents as opposed to 9.8 cents, which was the strike price for both the calls and the puts on the straddle. So here the call strike is 10 and a half cents and the premium is 0 0.002 cents per unit. The put strike, the put strike was 0 0.09 cents and the premium was 0 0.001 cent per unit. So you see there's a range instead of a specific value and the cost, the premium costs are much less than they were with the straddle. Again, the DRM contract controls 500,000 units. So they have to buy four. The DRM spot rate at the time was 10 cents. And we have the same possible three month spot rate scenarios that we looked at before. We examined the company using a straddle. So when the DRM spot is 9.8 cents, what do you have? You have an out of the money call and an out of the money put. So what's the company gonna do? The company is gonna convert in the spot market at 9.8 cents. It's gonna allow the puts and the calls to expire. And then to calculate the cash flows, we just say the 9.8, we say the 9.8 cents um, uh, multiplied by the 2 million minus the, uh, the, the, um, the cost of the, the premium cost, which nets us 190,000. Any questions how we calculated that? Okay. So now the currency is weakened. We want to convert at the highest possible price, right? So we can convert at eight cents and we can use the put option to convert. So we have an in the money put or an out of the money call. So we can use the put option to convert at nine cents as opposed to using the spot market to control at eight cents. So we're gonna convert using the put option and we're gonna let the call option, which is out of the money expire. And then we go ahead and we're gonna calculate our cash flows. Same thing, we're converting at nine cents we take into, take into account the premium cost, which is the same in each case, nets us $174,000. In the final case, when the DRM spot strengthens, what do we have? Well, we have an in the money call and an out of the money put, right? So what's the company gonna do? The company is going to convert in the spot market because it wants to convert at the highest possible price. So it can convert it 11 cents or 10 and a half cents right? Or I'm sorry, or at nine cents. So it's going to convert at 11 cents, but it has an in the money call option, right? So it can, it, it can buy at 10 and a half cents and it can then sell into the spot market at 11 cents and recapture some of the premium cost. So it's converting the DRM in the spot market to make the most, to, 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 to get the highest possible value. Yes. It lets its put options expire but it exercises its call options, buying at the strike and then selling the DRM in the spot market. So it makes a difference of 11 cents minus 10 and a half cents, so half a cent. So here we have, we converted here, our, our, our uh, uh, receivables, 11 cents. We take into consideration here, the difference between the strike price and the spot price on the DRM using the um, call options, and then of course the premium cost for um, uh, the two million dirham gives us a net cash flow of two hundred and twenty-four thousand dollars. Are there any questions here? This is a strangle. This is a strangle and because why the strike would, prices are different. Why would somebody do this over a straddle? It's less money. It's cheaper. Oh, the premium costs are cheaper. 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 I understand. That's it.
Perhaps. I have to think that through. Explain to us your thinking here. If I buy a call, if I have, if, excuse me, if I have the call, if with the call option, what am I protected against? I'm protected against higher costs, right? So I bought a call. If I sold the call, and how does that protect me if I sold the call option here? I don't see that it does protect us. All it does is it puts us into the position of speculating on the direction of the market. But I'm not sure that it helps us um, insulate us against the risk of um, uh, lost value with our receivables or um, uh, increasing costs of our payables. Um, let's think on that a minute, though. We'll come back to that. What happens, though, if this said bad? Yep. Sorry. Um why I don't understand why do you multiply the two million by the difference of the eleven cents and the and the call strike price? Well, because look, okay, Nicole, that's a great question. Great, great question. So the call option gives us the right to buy dirham at, at, at ten and a half cents. Mm -hmm. So we're getting in two million dirham. You want to convert it to the highest possible dollar value, which is at the spot rate of eleven cents, right? Yes. At the same time, though, you have an in the money call. So you can use the call to buy Duram at 10 and a half cents and then sell Duram at 10 and a half cents. You can do that with 2 million. You control 2 million Duram with your call options. So you can buy 2 million Duram and then sell 2 million Duram. Okay. You sell it for 11 cents, not 10 and a half. You buy the 10 and a half, sell it at 11, right? That's exactly right. You bought it at 10 and a half and then you sold it at 11. You bought it at 10 and a half and sold it into the spot market at 11. You made the, the you make the five cent difference, helps you recapture your premium costs. Does that help, sir. Nicole? Yes, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what's up? Uh, you asked what would selling a call protect you against? Wouldn't selling a call protect you against lowering costs, but your protection would just be limited to the principal that you earn if the option is not exercised, whereas if you bought a put, your gains are in a, I, I would say they're related to the decrease of the uh, currency. I think that's, uh, it, it, I, I like the way you're thinking. Um, that being said, by your own statement, you're limited by selling the call to the premium cost, right? Yes, plus meaning that if it drops. Plus, if it's a naked call, you have the potential of really losing if the market goes against you. Yeah, if you get exercised. Um, in our in our in our case here, um, what we're looking to do is protect the full value of the receivables. So, therefore, selling a call option wouldn't do that for us. That being said, um, I'm very impressed with the innovative and uh, thoughtful comments um, that are being made with regard to um, the derivative. So, so thank you, Professor. If if they were to exercise, can't you exercise your call and then? counteract not if i sold the call oh okay right they're two different things i bought a call and i sold the call those are two completely different things mm -hmm. okay never mind okay so now let's walk through what happens if the we've looked at the sale is successful now let's see if the sale is unsuccessful what the cash flows look like with the strangle So if the DRAM value is 98 cents, again, we have an out of the money put and an out of the money call. Because we sale wasn't successful, we want to convert, we owe the money, we owe the DRAM. So we want to convert at the lowest possible price. So here, the call option, we can buy DRAM at 10 and a half cents. So that's not useless to us. We're going to convert in the spot market and we're going to let the call and put options expire. And so our cash flow is very simple. The spot price multiplied by our notional. And then we take into account, of course, the premium cost means that our cost has been limited because of the, um, uh, the, um, because of the um, strangle to 202,000. If the value weakens, if the DRAM weakens to eight cents, then what do we have? We have an in the money put and an out of the money call. Right? Because I can buy DRAM in the spot market at eight cents, 
and I can put it to you, put it to the bank at nine cents, making a penny on every dirham. At the same time, I can buy in the spot market the two million dirham that I owe use at eight cents. So I'm going to convert in spot market. The call options expire, but I'm going to buy dirham in the spot market at eight cents, and I'm going to put it to the bank at nine cents, making the difference. So therefore, again, what do we see? We converted at the cheapest possible price to satisfy our payable. Then we took advantage of the in the money put. We bought in the spot market at eight cents. We put it to the bank at nine cents. And then we take into account, of course, the premium payment netted us or not netted us. Um, it showed the it showed a, um, a payment of $146,000, okay? And then finally, if the, if the currency strengthens to 11 cents, what do we see? Well, we have an in the money call and an out of the money put. So what does the company wanna do? They wanna convert at the lowest possible price. So they're gonna use the call option to convert at 10 and a half cents and they're gonna let their put options expire, showing them with a total cost of $216,000. Are there any questions here? Okay, I'd like to take a look at all this data a little bit more closely. So let's take a look at the various strategies we've gone over in our last two class sessions. So here was our strangle that we just did now with the call and put strikes and your three spot rate scenarios, yes? The potential outcomes for the successful sale of a strangle were 190,000, 174,000, and 224. If we compare the potential US dollar revenue from the strangle, from the straddle, that's where we start to see things that are revealing. So we see that with the straddle, we had cash flows Potential cash flow is 186,000. And then when the spot rate weakened, excuse me, in this first case, we see that the lower premium cost on the strangle yielded a greater value. That's the first thing that we see, another $4,000 in value. The next thing that we see is when the spot price falls to 174 and falls to eight cents, in both cases, the put option protected the company against a drop in the value of a dirham, whether under the strangle or the straddle. And finally, we see that when the spot rate strengthened, we see the value increased um, to 234,000 versus the 224 under the strangle because the strangle didn't offer the same type of protection as the straddle. Now let's take a look at the outcomes when the sale was unsuccessful. So under the strangle, we saw a potential cost of 202,000 with the straddle of 206,000. Why was the straddle more expensive? Because the cost of the straddle was more expensive. Here again, we had 146 when the spot rate fell as a potential cost or 134,000 as a potential cost when the spot rate fell. Of course, um, when the spot rate soared to 11 cents, we saw the potential cost at 216 under the strangle and 206 under the straddle. And so in this case, the call option protected the company against the rise in the value of the dirham and the higher premium cost, the higher premium cost under the straddle offered more protection. So when the sale was successful, the lower premium cost was very good up here. But when the sale was unsuccessful, the higher premium cost really helped when the currency um, uh, uh, appreciated. Are there any questions here? Okay, good. Let's talk about factoring, which is another technique that companies use, <clears throat> pardon me, to address their short-term capital needs.
What the firm is actually doing, excuse me, is it's selling the rights to its accounts receivable. And depending upon the credit worthiness of the company's accounts receivable, the mechanism of factoring is as follows. A factor, and just for the sake of discussion, the center for factoring is here in New York. Much of it on 6th Avenue where the largest factors in the world are based along 6th Avenue in the 50s by Rockefeller Center, just for your information. So what a factor does is buys accounts receivable and will fund the receivables based upon the credit worthiness of the receivables themselves. So if a company has a million dollar receivables in six months and they're very credit worthy, in other words, the factor fully expects to receive the revenue, well, then the factor is going to give a significant amount of that million dollars receivable upfront at time zero. The great thing about factoring is you can get the money very quickly, oftentimes within 24 hours. What the factor will do is keep some of the receivables as collateral. So it might say it's going to give 70%, 70, 30. The company gets 700,000 at origination. The factor keeps 300,000 until the uh, receivables come in and then we'll return the balance to the company less the fee, which is paid at the end. So let's take a look. Again, it's a great way to stabilize cash flows and free up capital. It's important to remember that the factor assumes all the credit risk, excuse me. And as I said, can be typically executed in 24 hours. <coughs> Factoring, excuse me, is particularly popular international trade when companies uh, need a lot of cash to fund their international trade activities. So certainly worthwhile for us to uh, introduce into our toolkit. Um, the elements of factoring include the fee, which is paid to the factor, the reserve, which is what the factor keeps until the trade effectively is over, and then the settlement, which is when the when is maturity. So the fees usually charge in the basis points per day. So 10 basis points per day means one tenth of 1% per day, which is 0 0.0010. So the reserve is that is held by the factor, as I said, and based on the credit worthiness of the accounts receivable and includes the fee. And then of course the settlement is the maturity date. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. So here the firm had a three month account receivable but needed cash today. It was 2.95 million and they needed money to make payroll expenses and fund some CapEx projects. And they decided to factor those account receivables. The fee here was in fact 10 basis points per day. The reserve was 30%. So let's, calculate the cash flows. At origination, the companies can get 70% of their receivables. So it's 2,065,000 that they have in their hand at time zero. And in three months, they'll get the balance less the fee. The company is gonna keep, the factor is gonna keep, excuse me, 30% of the, of the um, reserve, 30% of the receivables as a reserve. That's $885,000. Now what's the fee? The fee is 10 basis point per day times 90 days equals 9% times the 2.95 million means that the cost of the, to the factor, the cost for factoring was 265,500. Excuse me. And so at the conclusion of the trade, the conclusion of the term, the agreement, the factoring agreement, the company gets back the reserve less the fee for 619500 So the total to the firm in the three months was 2065000 at origination. And three months later, the 619500 for a total of 2684500 But that 2065 allowed it to do what? It meet its obligations at time zero to fund its payroll, to fund its capital expenditures, to meet its obligations. That's why factoring is a very important tool. Let's take a look at another example. So here was a company 
that had a 58 day receivable of $580,000 and they needed cash today to pay for raw materials. In this case, it was raw plastic. The fee here was 12 basis points per day and the reserve was 26%. The question I have for you, the question that we're faced with here is, what are the cash flows at origination and then maturity? And what is the net cash flow expected to the company? So the solution, we know we need the reserve, the fee, cash flow to origination, cash flow maturity, and then the net cash flow. So the reserve was 26% of the 580, or 15800. The fee was 12 basis points times 58 days times the 580 was 40,368. The total cash flow at origination was 74% of the receivables or 429,200. The cash flow at maturity was the 150,800, the reserve less the fee of 40,368 or 110,432. So the cash flow to the company was the 429 in change plus the 110 in change uh, was the 429 200 plus the 110 432. Okay, are there any questions here? Right. So you got to get back a total of the 539 632, which is the 580 less the 4368. That was the fee. So again, a very useful tool for global managers. Oh, professor, I have a question. Can you go back to the last slide? The, the, the other one with the 9%. Uh, so if you owe the fee is 9%, so that means you have to have like at least 9% growth for this to be profitable or? Not at all, not at all. What's the only objective in this case? What did the company need? Uh, it needs cash fast. It needs cash today fast. And that's why factoring exists because companies oftentimes need cash. Okay. And so it's not about their return. It's about getting the cash on hand in the most efficient, affordable way as possible. And if they have strong credit receivables, if they're weak, if it's the weak, the receivables, the credit worthiness is weak, well then of course, they're not going to do as well. They're going to pay a higher fee and get a lower amount of origination, and uh, uh, such is the nature of things. Um, but if they're, uh, the credit worthiness is strong, it's going to be a very uh, uh, advantageous um, uh, pathway to getting the capital that they need. Factoring is a very institutionalized uh, uh, mechanism within the um, world of international trade. So um, I hope that answers your thought there, Andrew. Yeah? Yeah. You're welcome. Let's move on to the next problem, which was a student years ago who went on to do a very interesting business. Um, so Ishmael was a Ishmael was a started a New York based manufacturing company and he had 129 day receivable of 4.35 million and he had one week to invest 3.25 million in a joint venture project developing solar panel products in Western Europe. True story. The credit worthiness of the account receivable was very strong. The factoring fee was 0.035%. So that's 0 0.00035. You have to remember that when you're doing your calculations on the exam on uh, uh, next week. The reserve ratio here is 15%. Again, the question is to calculate the cash flows. So we did. At origination, we get 85% of the receivables, which was 3 million. Ishmael got 3,697,500 that he was then able to use to invest in the project, which is exactly all that he needed. And because the credit worthiness of his receivables was so strong, he got a very good price. So the reserve was 15%, which left him with six, which gave the factor a reserve of 652,500. The fee, was 0 0.035%, so 0 0.00035 times 129, which was 4.515. So 
times the 4,350 was a price of 196,403. The cash flows at maturity then were the reserve less the fee for a net at, at, at maturity to Ishmael of the 456,097, which along with the Four fifty with the three million six ninety seven five hundred gave him the four million one ninety three five ninety eight allowed him to invest in the project in Western Europe and uh, do all the things that he needed to do um, within the time frame that he needed to do them um, and so that's why um, uh, in this case the factoring was an excellent uh, choice. Are there any questions here? How is Ishmael doing today? He is fantastic. Thank you. Professor, I have a question on how um, did you get the calculation for the 0.035%? Okay, so look up here, Nicole, the daily factoring through is 0.035%. It's not 0.035, it's 0.035%. Mm -hmm. So you have to say 0 0.035 divided by 100 gives you 0 0.0035. Okay, just um, not divide the 0.035%, just... Um... How would you represent 15% uh, as a number, you'd say 0.15, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because she said 15 divided by 100 is 0.15. Here you yeah. say 0 0.035 divided by 100 is 0 0.00035. Multiply it by the time frame of 129, gets you your total fee, which in this case was very low. Okay, because probably I did it wrong. Because when I, I I was doing it right now in the calculation, I didn't get that. I didn't. I got more zeros. <laughs> so 0 0.035. I'm doing it right now. Divided by 100. Multiply it by 129, gives you 4.515 percent exactly. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Good. You're welcome. So let's wrap up this evening with a discussion of some alternative hedging techniques, right? So one of the things that companies can do, in anticipation of a strengthening or weakening of a currency, is to adjust the timing of the payments that they have to make to reflect future currency movements, right? So here's an example of an English subsidiary, a UK subsidiary of a US company that buys supplies from a separate Hungarian subsidiary, which invoices the UK subsidiary in Hungarian foreign. Let's talk about that then. You have a US company with two subsidiaries. One is in the UK and one is Hungary. The UK subsidiary buys from the Hungarian subsidiary that then charges it in Hungarian foreign. So the UK subsidiary is concerned about the direction of the foreign, right? So if the expectation is, is that the pound is gonna weaken against the foreign, the Hungarian foreign, which is, uh, which is the Hungarian uh, currency, then the UK subsidiary can expedite its payments. At the same time, if it expects it to strengthen, then they can try to delay their payment, okay? These are called leading and lagging strategies. You expect it, the currency to weaken, you wanna lead with the payment. You expect the currency to strengthen down the road, you wanna lag and slow down the payment, okay? Now, there are long-term hedging strategies. We've always talked about short-term strategies was anything under a year. But naturally, there are similar strategies where companies um, uh, can hedge cash flows that are greater than one year in duration. So you've got long-term currency swaps, just the way we looked at forwards and currency options. Another very interesting technique are back-to-back -back or parallel loans. Here, companies borrow in their native currency and then will lend the proceeds from the loan to the subsidiary of the other company in order to get the best rates. So here we have two firms that are taking loans in their respective currencies. And then, as I said, lending the proceeds to the other's local subsidiary. Let's look at a good example. Here was a Canadian firm that borrowed Canadian dollars, Canadian, borrowed from Toronto Dominion. The firm borrowed in Toronto from Toronto Dominion, its home bank, and a French company borrowed from Bank Paribas in Paris um, uh, sorry, it wasn't Bank Paris. It was Bank. It wasn't Bank Paris. It was Bank National de Paris. 
So uh, the French company borrowed euros from BNP and uh, uh, the Canadian firm borrowed from Toronto Dominion, Canadian dollars. And the Canadian firm then lent its Canadian dollar, its Canadian loan proceeds to the Canadian subsidiary of the French, uh, of the French firm. And then the French firm lent the euros, the proceeds from its euro loan to the Canadian company's French subsidiary. I hope that everybody was able to follow me there. Each company borrows in their home currency, then lends the other country, uh, lends in the other company's subsidiary the proceeds of those loans. Why would two companies do that rather than just go to the bank? What's usually driving these types of decisions? What's usually driving a, a lending decision for the company? Okay, yes, time frame. What else? They want to invest in something to make money. Okay, what else is driving the uh, lending decisions? Whether or not a company is going to borrow from bank A or bank B? Interest rates. Interest rates. Interest rates are what? Their return on money and they're the cost. Thank you. The cost of money. What drives these decisions is cost. The reason the firms would enter into an agreement like this parallel back to back loans is because they can obtain better rates with their home banks and they might otherwise obtain their subsidiaries might otherwise obtain locally in those particular countries. Yes. So the Canadian subsidiary in Paris won't get as good a rate from a Parisian bank, Parisian based bank or French based bank. That's why companies do this because they can get better rates. Okay. So that's going to conclude our discussion of the lesson tonight. I want to spend the next couple of two, three minutes. We know we have the final is next Wednesday from 8.15 to 10.15. At this point, we've covered everything on this page. I'm going to post for you later tonight the slideshow from this evening. I'm also going to post for you another hedging problem set that's going to help you. So I'm encouraging everybody to do it. The answer to the problem set will be posted on Monday. Um, we will have class on Monday. It'll be an abbreviated class, but we will have class on Monday. I appreciate for everybody to attend. Um, I've been asked a number of questions about the final exam, and I, I, I will have more comments to make on Monday because I'm going to finish writing it this weekend, this coming over the next couple of days and polish it off over the weekend. Um, but I, I want to assure you this, is that the problems in the exam are going to look exactly like the problems in class. You're going to have theoretical questions, true, false questions, then you're going to have a whole series of calculations on hedging exactly like the way that we did in class, much like we've done this evening, for example, with factoring or interest rate caps or floors. So you need to know the mechanisms of those products and how they work, how we calculate the cash flows. And then I'm going to give you a multi-part problem on regional, uh, the, the welfare effects of regional trading relationships, which is an important part of our study um, this semester, regional trading relationships. So um, beyond that, um, like I said, I'm going to post the uh, hedging uh, uh, problem set for you later tonight along with the slideshow. Um, the answer to chapter 11 homework went up much earl went up earlier today. Um, and again, I remain available to you um, over the, uh, the course of the week. Um, and I want to wish everyone a lot of good luck um, as you uh, begin to embark on your uh, final exam period. I want everyone to do well. And uh, with our class, I'm, uh, again, the offer stands. I'll help you in any way that I can. Um, and I'm available to answer questions as needed. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop the um, uh, stop the share. We're going to stop recording. The recording has I'm gonna, stopped. I'm going to wish everyone a good, safe continuation of your evening, a good end to your week, safe end to your week, and I'll see you all next uh, next Monday. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all very Thank much. Good night. Good night.